Welcome everyone to this big questions panel event as part of Climate Services Week. It's been a great week so far, um, lots of really interesting events. So I'm hoping that this will be just the same um, and I'm really looking forward to, to seeing what our panel have in store for us. So we've got people in the room and people online and people from the Met Office and also some of our partners and customers joining. So welcome everyone and a particular welcome to our panel who I will come back to and introduce in a moment. So I was particularly keen to in include this event in um, Climate Services Week um, so that we could invite a wider range of voices from the climate services community and to air some of the issues which pervade the field that we work in and hear the viewpoints of those who've been working in this area for some time. And I'm hoping also that our diversity of panelists will mean they don't always agree with each other um, all the time, hopefully, um, and we'll have an interesting discussion today. So we've got a few housekeeping points um, just to help us run smoothly. Um, the way that this session is going to work, we've already got our questions for the panel. We had a great number of questions come in online ahead of the event, and you can find them on Slido, which is sli.do. Um, and if you put in the code big QS, all in capitals, then you'll find the questions. Um, we won't add any further questions now, um, but if you have a follow on question to anything that the panel have said or anything you'd like clarified, then if you're in the room, please put your hand up and Adam will come with the microphone. And if you're online, then please enter it in the, the Q&A chat. And importantly, you can vote for the questions that you most want answered online because we might not get through all of them. So if you go to Slido and click on the little thumbs up button for your favorite questions, then they will get bumped right to the top of the queue. And we'll make sure we answer those ones. And so to the panel, it's a great privilege to welcome them today. Some of whom I've looked up to and followed for much of my career in climate services. So let me introduce them now. So first up, in no order of importance, um, <laughs> we've got Chris Hewitt, um, who for the past 13 years has been Head of Climate Service Development and International Climate Services at the Met Office. Chris has strong interest in user engagement and bridging the gap between scientific capability and user requirements for decision making right across the world. So Chris, I'll start by asking you if you could just highlight one thing that you think has been a significant change or step forward in climate services in the last five to 10 years? Hi everyone, can you hear me Nicola? That's great, thanks Chris. I'll see you. Good morning. Um, yeah, thank you everybody for joining first of all. So I think this was good <coughs> as external experts. So as it said on the slide, actually half of my time, I'm professor of climate science, University of Southern Queensland. So maybe I'm putting that hat on. I've even got the t-shirt to prove it here. Um, and I also work a lot with the World Meteorological Organization. So perhaps I've got those two hats as well as a hidden Met Office hat. So I think for me, it's probably around collaboration and engagement. I think we've seen a huge increase I mean, climate services obviously has grown a lot anyway over the last five to 10 years, but there's been a lot of collaboration and engagement. So in my experiences, particularly through the global framework for climate services, which many of us have been heavily involved in, including myself, bringing together a whole range of different actors from all around the world. I think that's been fantastic, bringing the big community together. The climate services partnership, which many of the panelists have been very active in as well. And then I think perhaps all apart from maybe Bruce and Murray on the panel have been heavily involved in European activities as well around Climate Europe, for example. So the Climate Europe project, which has just finished, um, brought together the community of climate service practitioners around Europe. And there'll be a Climate Europe 2 follow on later this year, which is fantastic. Wasn't sure how long I should talk for, but I'll stop there. So for me, it's collaboration and engagement across all of the different communities, actors, stakeholders. It's not just being scientists or decision makers or a certain sector. I think there's been a big growth in this, this worldwide engagement. That's great. Thank you, Chris. Next up, we have Bruce Hewitson, who is the South African National Research Chair on Climate Change and Director of the Climate Systems Analysis Group at University of Cape Town. 
He's been involved in several of the IPCC assessment reports and has long been engaged in climate services and capacity development activities in Africa and well known to many of us at the Met Office. Currently, Bruce is focusing on new ways to enhance the usability of regional climate information for decision makers, including how to increase the robustness of the information, assess added value, the co-production of tailored products for decision makers, and the scalability of different modes of climate services. So same question to you, Bruce, if you could highlight one thing that you think has been a significant change or step forward in climate services recently. Uh, thanks, Jacqueline. Um, yeah, I concur with what Chris said, but being, I think, the only panel member from the Global South, I'm going to take a, a liberty of taking a Global South perspective on this. Um, to me, probably one of the most important and growing steps that is quite recent in development is an understanding within the climate services community of the role of ethics, values and cultural differences, and particularly the issues of power dynamics uh, in climate services. And we sit with a situation where many of the Global South's uh, stakeholders take their climate services from actors in the Global North. And we need a deeper understanding of the issues under underpinning that. And there are some significant issues under underpinning that. But we are seeing that emerge in the discussion. The latest IPCC report even had a, a bit of a discussion around ethics and values. Um, and I think this is growing quite fast and rapidly at the moment. The literature is growing around it. And it's certainly uh, something that is really needed, I believe, uh, to push forward in the future. That's great. Thank you, Bruce. And I, I, I agree entirely. Maybe that's a topic we'll come back to later in the questions. So next up, Professor Daniela Jakob is Meteorologist and Director of the Climate Service Centre in Germany, GEREX, and she was coordinating lead author of the IPCC special report on the impacts of global warming above 1.5 degrees C, above pre-industrial levels, and one of the lead authors of the IPCC fifth assessment report in Working Group 2. Her main research fields and areas of interest are local and regional climate modelling, the hydrological cycle, climate services and adaptation to climate change. Daniela is also editor-in-chief of the journal Climate Services, which she co-founded. So again, Daniela, I think this is going to get harder as we go down the panel, uh, but what would be your highlight from the last five to ten years of a significant change in the field? Yeah, for me, the um, most important uh, changes I agree with what has has been said before are um, two, I must say. One is that the IPCC report lately stated that we can see already an adaptation success. And adaptation success means that uh, adaptation options have been put into place and often they are using climate services to be to uh, to be designed. Let's put it this way. So I think the um, one really important point is that climate services are underpinning local action to adapt to climate change. And that is now already visible and it has been monitored and we find positive adaptation success, but also maladaptation. So we have to find out how climate services can even more underpin this. This is the one thing. And the second, for me, even more important is what has happened in the last five years is that climate services are not um, only seen as uh, supporting society to adapt to climate change, but uh, to adapt to the new 1.5 degree lifestyle, which means supporting climate resilient development, which is adaptation and mitigation. So I do think that climate services have uh, have now been matured in a way um, and that they are getting more important uh, beyond the field of adaptation to climate change. Maybe. That's great. Thanks. Yes, it's, it's really good to see our work having actual tangible impacts on the ground. Next, we have Murray Dale. Murray is a chartered meteorologist and technical director at JBA Consulting. He has 30 years experience in hydrometeorology, climate resilience and water management in the UK and internationally. He has recently been leading three UK climate research projects related to climate services and four climate and weather resilience projects for the World Bank. As a developer of climate services, 
is motivated by helping join together user needs with climate science and modeling options so that people get useful services wherever they are to support decision making, improve the environment and save lives. Over to you, Murray, for your one highlight. Thank you very much. Um, I, I also concur with the, the views that have been shared by the other panel members so far. Um, I, I thought perhaps something that might be useful to say here was the, the interesting advent of technical developments in climate modelling recently, which I feel have enabled a step change in climate uh, services in many ways climate services have been around you know you could argue for 50 years or more i think that we've always been able to um, develop services from from climate information from uh, weather and uh, climate data that have enabled us to develop services that help support decisions but it's perhaps in recent years in the, in the last decade and perhaps that um, climate services have taken off as an actual uh, entity in that in their own right you, you could argue. Um, for me, a technical development that's been really important in the last five years, is, that's especially affected the UK, has been the advent of convection permitting modelling, which means that we're now in a position due to increased computing power and technical developments and understanding in the atmosphere to be able to simulate um, convective processes. So those are the ones that drive very intense rainfall. And because we've been able to do that and uh, fortunate in the UK to have a, a national model that, that provides information across the country on um, two kilometre scales, that, that we have now information that's very useful to develop services related to um, rainfall intensity. Of course, there are many other risks that we face um, throughout the world with um, related to climate other than rainfall intensity, but that's one area where I think there has been a big step change and it's, and it's I think, deserving of uh, a mention. But I, I also agree with the other comments made and support Chris's view about collaboration and engagement, which is also an interesting area. Thank you. Thanks, Murray. And I think um, plenty of potential to exploit that capability further. Um, in the UK. So on to Bart. Bart van den Herk is, uh, has a background in climate scenario and service development in the Dutch Met Office, KNMI, but is now scientific director at Deltares, where he's engaged in all sorts of projects and programmes where climate information is used in societal topics, including strategic planning of national water safety, enabling regions to carry out climate risk assessment and providing guidance on IPCC and sea level rise for non-scientific professionals. So over to you, Bart, if you can think of anything to list or add to our list of highlights. Yeah, thank you for the, for the attention. I, coming from a MET service, I mean, we, we are all uh, experienced with MET services, right? With, uh, with meteorological uh, weather reports, etc. And what I noticed that now uh, climate services are also reaching the citizens, <coughs> the public in the, in the streets. Uh, just last week, uh, we got a, a flyer from the municipality that would map, say, a, a floodplain, uh, given a uh, very extreme rainfall event in our neighborhood and where the water would accumulate. And then that was just to warn everybody in the street, hey, your, your garden is in that area that, that tends to be flooded or your cellar is below that level. Well, that's a clear climate service that is provided from a, from a public entity, but actually there's a lot of commercial uh, companies that have produced that map. There was a commercial entity that made that high resolution modeling that is required for this. And that also is, is mirroring uh, the development of, of weather services that, that also started to be, say, public entities and where now also more and more you know, private companies entering. We discuss uh, sea level rise in the parliament uh, because climate services allow to make inspections of, uh, say, absurd sea level records along our coast. And they are compared to the scenarios that KNMI has provided. And there's, of course, a mismatch or some interpretation needed. And, and we get questions on that in, from Parliament. And that also, I think, is due to the, the existence of these public platforms that, where everybody can go and, and, and check out uh, the observations. So I think democratizing, say, knowledge or facilities or, 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 or information sources, that I think is a very great, uh, great value. And 
yeah, reflecting on Bruce's comment, I'm really looking forward to, yeah, uh, I, I do realize that we are living in a very profitable place on the planet where this, this, this access is, 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 free, is, is guaranteed for every one of us. And we really need to think about getting this, this accessibility uh, spread across the planet, I would say. Thanks, Bart, and I think we'll come back to some of those those topics later on. Last but very much not least, we have uh, Jeanette Bessenbinder, who has worked on climate services since 2005. And she works for KNMI as Senior Advisor on Climate Services, um, but since 1st of May, she's also got a position as Professor of Climate Literacy at the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences. She's involved in user interaction and tailoring of climate information around the KNMI climate scenarios for a large variety of sectors and has been involved in several European projects relating to climate services. Janetta, let's see if you can add, add one last highlight to our list before we move on. Yeah. Well, I also agree what others said, but what I uh, found particularly interesting the last uh, years, five to ten years, is that uh, a lot of climate data has become much more easily available to all kinds of people um, and not just researchers, climate researchers. Um, however, you need a lot of knowledge to uh, use that data in the correct way and you need to know where to find it. And that uh, links also to the ethics, I think. Um, um, and to, I think we can learn we, we can improve still a lot in uh, the assess of the data and the correct interpretation of the data. Great, thanks very much. So, and the last person that I, I haven't introduced yet is, is Stacey News up beside me, who's going to help me to, to chair this panel. Um, keep an eye on the questions as they, they move about um, and, and help take any questions. Um, so, without any further ado, we'll get on to the questions which you, our audience, have posed to the panel. And I can see that people are voting. Um, so, please do, if you haven't yet voted, um, have a look through the questions and see which ones take your fancy. Um, I'm, I, I'm still hoping we're going to get some disagreement with the panel. So, maybe a prize to the first one who manages to disagree with someone else. Um, so, I'm going to start with the question at the top of our vote, um, which is, should climate services be subject to standards such as an ISO standard to ensure quality? And, and I guess this could be a range of things from very formalised standardisation to, a, to a, less, um, a less formal approach. And I'm going to go first to Murray because I know you've been doing quite a lot of work on this recently. So over to Murray um, and then the floor is, is there for the rest of the panel. Okay, so, okay uh, thank you very much, Nicola. Um, I've been leading a team who have been engaged in a project for 18 months um, and it will be completed in October this year, uh, which is setting out to develop a, a standard for climate services. Um, it's focusing on climate services that are um, from, from sort of all ranges of the time frames from historic observed data in the in the past uh, or up to present time uh, and then into the future uh, with the sort of seasonal forecast coming first and then going into decadal and longer term adaptation services. Um, it's been a very interesting process, challenging process. We've worked with um, co-authors or of the ISO standard on climate adaptation. So those are members of a, a firm called Climate Sense, John Dora and Doogie Black. Uh, we've also engaged with British standards and we've engaged with a lot of um, people in the UK and internationally on the, on the standard that we've been developing. So we have a working draft at the moment which has been out for consultation. Um, on the question as to whether a standard is needed, um, it's a difficult one to answer, but I think on balance and the, the through the experience of the project we've had to date, it, it is certainly an advantage, we believe, to have a standard, provided it is one that works with a 
relatively new area for standards, if you like. And so the thing we want to avoid is stifling of innovation. Um, we want to make it possible for any provider of a climate service to feel that they, they're not constrained in what they're doing, but they are supported through this standard in a way that means that they can um, help ensure that the, the standard, that the services of a quality level that is um, seen to be necessary for, for a climate service. Uh, and there are other attributes that the, the standard can have, such as um, accountability, transparency, the, the ethical question as well, um, so that services can be available to all. Um, and um, I think on balance, we'd say that yes, a standard is certainly very useful. So is it needed? I would say yes, we, we could argue it, it is needed. Um, but it's it's a question of getting that standard right so that it doesn't, uh, as I say, stifle innovation or um, prevent people from from feeling that um, they can they can develop standards, uh, develop services, I should say. I'll stop there, perhaps, and see if there's any other comments on this point. So I'll invite the other panel members if you'd like to to offer any views. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Chris. Thank you. Can you hear me? I assume you can. So, um, yeah, I, I like your challenge for us to disagree. I'm going to struggle because I've been passionate about this for quite a long time. Um, I've been lobbying, I suppose, might be too strong a word, but working with the WMO and the European Commission for quite a long time to get this idea of standards for climate services on the agenda and make progress. And it was going slowly. So as Murray said, in the UK, we decided to go ahead and um, do some work. So thank you to Murray and the team for bid bidding in to the call that we produced on this. Um, so we're delighted that's happening. And then this Climate Europe 2 project that I mentioned earlier, I finally succeeded with the European Commission and they have now got a project that's going to look into standards. So Climate Europe 2 will be tackling this head on as well. So Murray, I'm hoping you'll be able to connect up with that project when it starts later this year. I, I think Murray's right though. So I've, I've always sort of, as, as you were talking or sitting here thinking, I've always assumed that standards are needed and it's the right thing, but of course it's not really for someone like me to say that. So at some point, maybe this is the place we can start to disagree on then. It, it's who is it for to decide whether a standard is needed? It's definitely not me. I can see that it's, it's useful. Murray agrees that it's useful by the sound of it. The other panelists probably agree, um, but, but I don't know how we go ahead with that. And then the next part, which might be more controversial if we can have an argument, is who will actually police these standards? So I remember Guy Brasseur, who many of you know, you know, I talked about this quite a long time ago. I think, Daniela, you were involved in those discussions and Bruce. It's all very well having a standard, but someone's have to going to be the police for this. And it's not clear. It certainly wasn't 10 years ago when we were talking about this. Who would do that? The WMO seemed like a, an obvious place to be heavily involved in this. Uh, Murray may have opinions on how it worked nationally and others may have opinion across Europe and places. So I don't know how it would be policed, but I do personally think we should be having more standards. We do have standards, to be fair. There already are standards for parts of climate services, not necessarily for the services end, but the underpinning capability, there's a huge number of international standards. So Murray and the team have been working more towards the, the, the decision making end of this. So I'll stop rambling there. But yeah, the answer for me is yes, I think we do need them. Not quite clear how it's going to play out and how we will police them. <laughs> Please, someone else jump in. Um, I'll, I'll let you discuss this until there's no more to be discussed. Yeah. May I? May I add something? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what I think is really needed is some kind of quality assurance. And whether you arrange that with standards or in another way, uh, I don't think that's, um, that can be discussed. But standards could be a good way to do that. Uh, but then the, the the big question is what is really uh, the quality of the the climate services and it may be that uh, scientists providers users have a different opinion on what is 
the quality of a climate service. Uh, users may be very happy with uh, a certain service, uh, whereas the scientists would say, well, it doesn't include any information about uncertainty about future climate, so it's not really a good service. So I'd like to jump in with the Global South perspective here and disagree a little bit because I think language is really important here. Um, I think when we talk about standards, we're often talking from my perspective of standards. Climate services inherently require flexibility. The value of their effectiveness is in their flexibility to adapt to the context. Um, so standardizing that would likely lead to a constrained formulaic approach to climate services if you talk about standards in that sense. Um, I think if you change the language a little bit and start talking about standards of practice, principles mm -hmm. of practice, even go as far as talking about a code of practice, then one starts becoming effective, I believe, because there's no way we can practically, pragmatically police this, um, whose authority and who decides these standards in any case. But we wrote a paper a few years ago and we, we talked about some of these things. Um, for example, typical principles of practice or code of practice would be that Uncertainty should always be characterized and communicated. Methodologies used in constructing information should be transparent. Contradictions should be addressed. The limits to information should be included. Those sorts of principles um, around how the, how the practice goes. But I'm wary of a standard that says, this is the way to do climate services. If you don't follow this, then you're not doing proper climate services. Yeah, I, I can. I could add to that. I mean, the the purpose of standardization is to yeah, to get something things done that you cannot do without standardization. And for instance, standardization of the the weather observations are, have definitely helped uh, uh, the the quality of weather forecasting, for instance. And without standardization, you couldn't do that. But for for climate services, they, they we need to be aware that that definition of quality, but also of applicability or practical approaches, as Bruce says, they are very divergent uh, across different uh, spatial domains, uh, across different cultures, even across different applications. And I'm a bit concerned that that uh, a high emphasis on standardization there may actually uh, reduce uh, yeah, market penetration or or development of climate services. And we do experience also at Del Tires, where we do a lot of work with, with say, uh, also in entities in, in Eastern Europe that have quite different, say, practical approaches to flood risk management or whatever. They, they have quite different attitudes to what they actually request from, from the climate services than, than, than the more probabilistic things, uh, uh, way of working that we have in the Netherlands, for instance. And if you're not sensitive to that, if you're not able to, yeah, adjust your standards to, say, the local practice, you, you may actually miss out on, on opportunities to, to utilize it. So, so standardization, yes, but for the purpose to improve its, its support to decision making, which means that you need to incorporate a lot of diversity in definitions of, of quality or applicability. And I'm not sure how to standardize that kind of things. Maybe I can jump into here, but... Um... Maybe I can come in with a comment here. So I'm, as, Chris, as you know, <laughs> I'm very critical when it comes to standards. And uh, why am I so critical? Um, I have the experience from the wind, uh, wind power assessment sides. So I do think, and I fully agree with, uh, uh, with the quality um, improvement and also with Bruce saying we need some maybe code of practice or some some uh, uh, guidance and maybe some standards in this way but and I, and i think it's important for for the i think it's important to have kind of a capacity development to increase the quality to make sure that the knowledge is provided how to provide a, a high quality climate service product so it's it's also a matter of education and and capacity development, um, and that can be maybe part of a standardization. But when it comes to standards in the way that a specific method is prescribed with let's say five five steps to be followed to carry out the assessment, then it can also happen that you are limiting 
the information you get and you think you increase the quality. Standards are often used for comparing different assessments which have been done in competitive ways. And, uh, and I think for this, it is uh, something which is used and which often mimics a higher quality. But just following a standard does not mean that the quality is better than another assessment which has maybe more context-specific uh, insight in the development of the product and in the use of the product and application of the product, but has not followed the explicitly the standard rules. So I think it's a very difficult topic here, and I personally think they, there might be some areas within climate services, maybe on the data side, where standards can help to homogenize approaches to um, to underpin uncertainty assessments from a data quality point of view, but there are other areas which I would say where standards are limiting uh, the, uh, the usefulness. May I make a response if it's possible? Uh, thank you, it's been very useful to hear those comments. I just wanted to pick up on three things quickly. The, the element of quality is definitely a part of the standard we're developing um, and fully support that that's a, a, an area that the, the standard has can offer a significant benefit on. The other thing to say is that the way in which we've developed this standard is perhaps moving towards a code of practice anyway because the, the terminology we've used is a mixture of requirements and guidance and advice. So there are um, some shall clauses within the within the standards so that we, there are some requirements, but there are also quite a lot of um, you should consider or um, it, it would be beneficial to do this. So there are elements which are, are more around a, a form of guidance than, than requirements. Um, and so we're trying to be careful to ensure that we're not constraining developers of climate services to produce things in a very strict format. But a, a lot of the, the areas where there is um, support for this is to, to demonstrate that you're, you're, um, you're doing things for the right purpose and following some form of good practice. One area that hasn't perhaps been discussed much yet is co-development with the users. So a key feature of what we've been developing is to make sure that wherever possible, users are involved from the design of the service, not, not towards the end, but, but throughout the process from the, the way in which the service is designed to, to where which it's created, to the way in which it's tested and then monitored in the future as it as it becomes a, a live service um, so it can be revised based on user user requirement and uh, along the points that Bart's making the these users uh, could be um, farmers in a in a country in Africa where there are specific user needs which will simply not be met by a form of service that might apply elsewhere in, in another country so we're very keen to see what can be done to try to encourage the process of user interaction right from the design of the uh, standard, uh, I keep saying standard, a uh, service. Yeah, I, I typically like the, the comment that Daniela makes that actually you should be able to demonstrate that it helps to, to raise capacity from also on the client side um, and, and, and maybe some monitoring on that part should be part of the of the code of practice that you really uh, you, you don't rest until you have really uh, um, uh, confirmed that 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 the service is, is has has led to an improved uh, uh, understanding or manageability of the uncertainty whatever by by the client or by the user of that service and that capacity the building element, I think, is a good part of that uh, code of practice. And by the way, that works two ways. Uh, also, the providers of climate services learn a lot 
by varying their clients uh, and, and, and they also enrich their uh, usefulness by, by just listening to a lot of people that use their services. Um, I think we'll we'll draw back from oh I pressed the sorry draw back to the questions now. I think there's some really interesting nuances raised there, and you've um, landed on quite a few of the challenges with this topic. Um, and it's great to hear from Chris that there are a number of activities ongoing in this area. So um, some to keep an eye on there. We'll move on to the next question, which has come to the top of the list, which says should providers evaluate whether climate services improve decision making. Um, so I guess whether they actually have the, the intended impact. And I guess maybe if if you think providers maybe shouldn't, then who who should or should anyone? Um, I don't know who wants to start with this, so I'll just go to the panel and you can you can shout for it. I'm happy to start. So um yeah, thank you. It depends on how you read the question as to which word you emphasise. Um, and I think you just articulated there as you were reading out, Nicholas. So should providers evaluate whether they do this or should other people do it is, is one way of reading this question. Or when providers are providing climate services, should they just as part of their activities be evaluating whether the services improve decision making? Um, I think those are two different nuances. So the, the provider role, since I predominantly work at an organisation that provides climate services. It would seem as I think several of these questions actually from here on link into what Murray just talked about as well. So these questions do link to ideas of standards or codes of practice. So in terms of good practice, it would seem sensible to me that um, providers should be trying to evaluate whether their services are actually making a difference. That won't necessarily apply in all of their services, but that would seem, I think Murray just used the phrase where appropriate, um, where appropriate it would be good to see if it's able to do that. I can't remember if there's a question about this, but it's very difficult to actually do that. So we, we do try that routinely in our services in the, the Met Office, um, but it's not simple. But the other way of reading that question, should who should be doing that evaluation? I don't know the answer to that one. I'd quite like to hear the, the views of the other panellists. Um, so to create a controversy, I will say, yes, providers must do that. I don't think that's actually true. I don't think providers are necessarily the best place to evaluate. I think it's part of this co-production idea. It's something that should be done across the different um, actors, if we're allowed to call it a value chain, the different people on the value web or value chain. I think there is a role for different voices in that evaluation. But my answer is I think yes, I think there should be an attempt. It's not easy. It's easy to say do it, but it's not easy to do it in our experience. We should be trying to evaluate the, the effect that our services make on decision making. Maybe I jump in here, is that okay? So, um, yes, Chris, um, I think uh, providers should be involved in evaluation of climate services. Um, and of course, uh, it is always a question of which part of the service you're evaluating and, um, and how this part was helpful for, take, for taking a decision. So I, I think this uh, this is a very big question and uh, uh, it is a very important question. And I do think as uh, it's similar to the development of climate services, which I strongly um, uh, uh, emphasize the, the core design and the core development and the core construction of the climate services. There's also the core evaluation of the climate service. So there are, of course, uh, other groups involved in evaluating of the, if the service has made sense. So the different steps in the in the production have to be developed in along different criteria. But this all will not help much if the provider is not able to take into account what the evaluation says. Finally, so just evaluating the climate service and if it makes sense and helped the decision making is uh, not enough. Let's put it this way, because that's pretty much what we are doing in science and everywhere. We do tons of evaluation, but the outcome does not necessarily change your daily routines in pro producing climate services. So uh, I think we have to go a step further and say how how can the evaluation influence the production of the climate services and help uh, um, uh, uh, making those products even more 
usable, useful, uh, efficient, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I think that's 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 an important point. Uh, you you referred before, Daniela, that the IPCC is reporting an uh, an, uh, an adaptation success. So there's a, a growing level of adaptation. So that at least demonstrates that it is monitorable uh, how the adaptation goes and how climate decisions are uh, developing. Uh, at the same time, uh, they uh, monitor also maladaptation and they also monitor adaptation gaps. And uh, and, and that is, of course, of a, of a big concern to, to most of, uh, of the countries, that the adaptation gap is, uh, is increasing. So, that, so the, uh, uh, apparently it's possible to, to monitor that decision taking, but it's, of course, not that easy to attribute that decision taking to the climate service that we that we develop. Because we can also argue that 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 the adaptation is actually a response to just the climate that is changing, and people are just witnessing that climate change and are forced to adapt, and then they don't use any other climate service than just look out the window and say, "Hey, uh, uh, rain is increasing," which is a climate service as as, as such, of course, uh, that you that you have a good uh, uh, record of intensification of of extreme events is a is a is a good service. But I I would. Yeah, I, I, I find the attribution thing difficult um, because it it requires also quite a bit of insight in decision taking, in behavior, in, in you know uh, uh, measuring, say, credibility of information, effectiveness of the way that we communicate. I'm personally not convinced that our scientific uh, emphasis on producing many, many future scenarios of, of what can happen is 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 in the end going to be effective to make society make uh, uh, informed changes because the number of scenarios that are going to be developed is 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 reaching infinity and, and people can just select their scenarios that are matching the sort of pictures that they already have uh, before looking at them and and i think we that 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 is not necessarily the most eff effective way to to make a society adjust to uh, to changing conditions and there i really Thing that that something has to be learned on it, and, and the developers of climate services and the scenario developers, etc., they really need to to yeah take seriously uh, yeah the information about how that information is being perceived and how did it actually lead to uh, uh, changes in decisions. And I agree, it's not uh, easy, but it's also part of yeah uh, the product that you that you're providing. You want it to be successful. You want it to be you know uh, uh, that that the societal group can respond to it. So it's part of your your know, business model to evaluate the effectivity. I would say. Maybe I can just comment on on Bart uh, for a second, uh, just directly. I think that is it's, it's really really important what you said because. Um, I do think that what has started now, at least in, in, in our climate service, that we are having um, an evaluation team right set up from the beginning, which is starting the entire process of product development, the dialogue with the stakeholders. It's, it is accompanying and evaluating all steps in the chain from the first contact to the client, to the delivery, and then the impact of the delivery. So, uh, mm -hmm. so has it really helped after a year or two or three going back? So, uh, so I think that is, uh, uh, and it includes a lot of social science and behavioral science right from the beginning within the design of the product. Excuse me, Bruce, yeah. up to you. Yeah. We can't hear you, Bruce. Sorry, um, I was muted. Um, I want to add something that hasn't been discussed in this co comment yet, and I, I do agree with Chris that the language and the emphasis is really important. It reminds me of the Shakespeare phrase, to be or not to be, where you put the emphasis changes the question altogether. Um, I don't think providers should be held in the responsibility of evaluating the, the decision making. I think that's something we probably all agree on. However, I do think providers have a responsibility to evaluate the decision making in the purpose of learning about the decision-making content, because that is going to change how they conduct their um, climate studies, how they do their practice. And a critical issue here that I see as a great gap in climate services is how do you measure added value? The added value of a decision, is the decision improved? How do you measure that? Especially when climate change decisions are non-verifiable until the climate change has taken place. So 
there's a real special issue here how to measure improved decision making as there is in the measuring added value of the information product that you're providing. Um, and I think this is a research area that is wide open for uh, further work at this moment because I don't have a clear answer on it. I, my response to that, uh, Bruce, is how, how do you measure if it's been effective is ask the user because I think the user is the best place, individual or, or group, to, to be able to tell you qualitatively even Yes, it's been useful. We were able to do this with that service. Uh, without the service, we would have been in this position, but with it, we are now able to do this. Um, but I think that this whole discussion point, and I, I support what everyone, everyone said about the, the need for uh, users to be involved in the evaluation, not just the provider. But I think this whole thing points to the importance of having users involved in the production of climate services right from the start. So. If a provider thinks, I think this user wants this, and they set out and produce a service and then say to the user, how do you find this? Already that's too late to introduce the discussion. They should be involved in the design so, so that the, you've got this process that start, starts at the start and, and carries on through as the service is evaluated and, and monitored year on year, that the user has this important voice throughout, I think. So I'd like to contest that a little bit. Um, in principle, yes, I would agree. But when a user says there's an improved decision, the user is making that claim or making that statement from the perspective of their agenda. And very often decisions are not binary decisions of a right and a wrong. Decisions are, do we follow this trajectory or do we follow that trajectory? And different communities have different ideas what those, what those values are. So when you say an improved decision, it may be an improved decision from the decision maker's agenda's perspective, but that may very much not be the improved decision from many other communities' perspectives. And we see this in developing nations extensively, where it's not an A or B. There's a multiplicity of choices, and one person is making the choice and saying this is an improved decision. And very often the case that that is very debatable. Yeah. But I fully agree with you uh, on this. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so I was, I was going to say, um, sorry, I, I agree with this as well. I also agree with Bruce's phrase. So in principle, um, yeah, Murray, this, this is what we should do. But in practice, even in, perhaps even worse than Bruce is describing, it's a bit depressing that climate information is often not actually <laughs> the most important part or even necessarily an important part of the decision making. While we'd love to think it is and we need to carry on thinking that so that we're motivated to do this, I understand that. It's often for the decision makers, it's it's a useful part of information. I mean, on the climate change time scale, obviously it's, as you've said, Bruce, it's difficult to verify. Seasonal time scales, there's issues perhaps around um, predictability and skill, all those sort of things. So we shouldn't get too excited about the fact that we think our information is definitely making them say yes or no in a decision context, because often it isn't. And so this evaluation is, is very difficult. And yes, we should ask the user, I do agree. Um, but we are finding it very difficult to then get actionable feedback because you're right Daniela we need to then action on whatever feedback we get it is difficult to get feedback that, that really helps us clearly but we do need to do this I'm not saying we shouldn't but it is very difficult uh, I, I'm sorry there's an area ripe for research so I'm, I, I also think there's an area for research but I'm a bit puzzled because um, uh, Chris did you just say it is difficult to understand if the climate service information has contributed to the decision. I mean, if you look at all the design um, calculations for sewage systems, they all take up climate data into climate information. And this is a climate service. So, I mean, the, the decision on, on uh, the design of infrastructure, on um, agricultural methodologies, land management, even on where to place, where to place housing, um, uh, on in, increase uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the protection against sea level, they all have information in it which are climate services. So, yeah, I'm not saying so that, sorry. I, I mean, so the there question, are some. do you want to say we would have not taken this measure 
if we would not have been informed through climate services? Is that what you are after, or are you saying the decision would have been different without the information of the climate service? Or, or what are you looking for? There are sectors where and you've given great examples where this. Sorry. I think who's going to talk, Nicholas? Shall I talk? You go, Bart. Okay. Uh, I, th I think what it's very difficult to measure whether the decision is improved or not because it depends on the the, the, the the point of view that you that you take on the decision. I agree with Daniela that in many cases climate services uh, contribute to the decision, um, but then in the end um, the 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 the, the quality of the decision is, of course, very difficult to assess. And, and, and I think in many cases, uh, a decision has to be justified. And, and climate services, they do justify some this decision. Right? That, that, for instance, for the housing uh, uh, dilemma on where to put extra houses in, 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 in a low-lying country like the Netherlands, climate services obviously put, put that, put say, climate risk on the agenda, which doesn't say that climate risk is going to determine that these houses will not be located in, in low-lying floodplains because there's other drivers to put these houses there. Yeah, there's economic drivers, et, et cetera. But at least there has been a consideration of a climate dimension in that whole decision. But as Chris says, and that's, I think, how I understand it, that piece of information is only part of the entire decision that in the end has to be made. And, and it is there, but uh, it's, it's not very easy to attribute the end decision to, to the, the climate information because there's a lot of other information that also has entered. Yeah, but maybe, but um, yes, you're right, it's not easy. But I also think we have to go beyond the assumption that the climate service is a data product. So the evaluation of the climate service is also evaluating the process, how to reach the decision. And that is a process of dialogue in between. Uh, are you, so have the climate service provider accompanied you while you try to reach your decision? Mm -hmm. And then I think it is a different way to see and, and, and evaluate, elaborate, I would say first, or assess if the decision would have been taken differently without the accompanying climate service component in it. And this is why I said it, we need these accompanying evaluation teams in the entire value or communication chain. And, uh, and of course, the, the indicators are not so easy. We, haven't not, we, have, we did not talk about the indicator, how to, what is the indicator um, uh, which determines uh, the quality of the decision the, 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 or whatever. I mean, we just talked about uh, uh, the, is the decision being influenced or would it be different? So I think that there, there is a series of soft skill indicators involved. Yeah. Um, at the different stages, and and this makes it complex. But I think it is um, it uh, it makes it also very efficient if we then uh, in turn do the loop back and learn from from all those processes. No, I, I fully agree, and, and and I don't want to paraphrase climate service as data because indeed you're right that the, the, the process itself is there, and indeed the indicator of interest is whether climate information has contributed to the decision whatever the end point of the decision is, because with the same climate information, you can have different uh, decisions on whether or not to put these houses in these low-lying areas, depending on, on the weight of the, the other arguments, right? But as long as you can detect that the climate information and its explanation or its, its guidance and its, its, its you know, uh, uh, provision to the debate at the right moment in the debate, it's also yeah, you have to understand how decision taking takes place. Sometimes as a scientist, you need to shut up uh, to, to have other people uh, talk and then at other places you have to be there because that's the point where the decision is really informed by climate information. So that, 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 that requires quite a clever engagement process, I fully agree. But as long as you can detect the process, the decision has been taken by taking into account that climate information, I think you could tick mark your, your satisfaction box. It has contributed.
Can we come in on, on your point, Bruce, about the fact that there's lots of potential uh, different changes in the climate that might be projected, and, and that is the decision the right one, and it's not just black and white one, uh, binary decision. Um, that's very important, and part of the, the standard is that we're doing is looking at uncertainty and how that's managed. So it's very important to translate all this massive information into information that's decision friendly, if you like. So you might say to use a big probabilistic distribution, you've got a best estimate and a reasonable worst case. So you've got two two methods of uh, or two estimates of change which can then be used to inform the way in which you take a decision. Do I want to be very precautionary and use the reasonable worst case or do I want to be sort of hedging in the middle and saying um, we'll, we'll use the best estimate from the range of distribution. Still of course the errors and these could be wrong as well but there's a there's ways of translating the, the massive information into um, information that's user friendly in that sense so people will understand reasonable worst case and best estimate um, for example and, and putting a sewer in the ground people have to make a big decision are we going to do this because it's a massive investment or are we going to try and manage that water above ground uh, with sustainable urban drainage systems etc and, and do things that are more an adaptive slow process or do we want to bite the bullet and take the big precautionary um, adaptation option. I think that is, you know, the way in which uncertainty is managed in the in, in climate projections is a very important part of the climate service that it needs to consider. I'll bring this I'll, I'll one. Come back. Sorry, I'm just going to bring this one to a close a second. Um, may, maybe if you, you wanted to make a point later, Bruce. Um, I, I think there's there's clearly so much that we could discuss on this topic and I didn't see it being quite so controversial. So congratulations to whoever submitted that question. Um, I think I think the points of who who is the evaluation for and what is the purpose of the evaluation are obviously really key. Um, and I think Daniela's point about if, if we're going to do evaluation, then acting on that evaluation and having having the scope to act on that built in to the the process right from the start um, through through the the co-processes with with everyone involved seems really important. Stacy, what question have we got next? I'll try my best not to um, emphasize any particular words but the next most popular question <laughs> is which of scientists, service providers or end users should determine when new science is ready for use in climate services. So hopefully I didn't emphasize anything of, of importance there, but um, who would like to start off with that one? Maybe I can start with this one. Yeah. I don't think there's one particular group that should uh, decide on it. Um, it's something that you do together. Uh, I have some experiences from, from uh, for example, on uh, extreme precipitation, where uh, users wanted to have it translated to some practical statistics that they could use in design, whereas scientists could say, well, there's still a lot unknown. Uh, it cannot be used directly into uh, to practice, but you can, can find ways together to uh, make something that is usable uh, but it also indicates limitations. So it, it's something that you do together, I think. Uh, I'll, I'll come in on that and fully agree. It's got to be a, a, a cross community activity that does that. But I'd point out that the readiness of new science is predicated that we can measure added value in the, in the new science. Just because it's new doesn't mean it's added value. Uh, very often new science could actually add to confusion. So we need to have demonstrable added value associated with that. Um, and that it's not going to be inflating the uncertainty artificially uh, enough for the decision maker around that. So definitely this is a, a determination that I think requires involvement of all. Yeah, maybe I can be a bit critical here. Um, because um, 
I think again we have to to disentangle the the question a little bit. Um, so added value for whom, Bruce? Um, the science might be ready uh, for different parts of the three mentioned uh, if they look at the added value from a different perspective. So just getting the information for a user that there's a new set of simulations available which is probably supporting what they have known before might be an added value for the user, even if the scientist would say not all aspects of the simulations are supporting what has been said before. So, I mean, the scientist would have been probably more critical in saying uh, this is a supportive set of scenarios compared or set of information compared to what we have known before. So I think this, um, um, I, I think it is it is important for the science to um, to have reached a specific stage of certainty and being convinced that the results or the knowledge which we have gained is not a singularity in a scientific from a scientific point of view before it goes out to the to into the used. Uh, space. So I would not say that um, that uh, all science uh, is ready if it's, uh, uh, let's say, on the on the testing side. And I, I also think there is a danger if we if we um, if we communicate every little step in science in a way to the to the users that this step is already ready for use, then the the development of the scientific knowledge in the back might be influenced in a way which is either good or not so good. So I think there are very critical spheres in here. That's I, I'm not sure if you understand what I, what I mean. So, but it's it's not the best day for me today. But but uh, I think we, the science needs a bit of. Um, let's say, a secured uh, uh, room to develop. And then there is kind of a layer where, uh, uh, where scientific knowledge, which is like almost ready for use, gets into the dialogue space or sphere. And then we might have steps where we say this is a solid knowledge and it is ready to build decisions for trillions of US dollars on it. So there, there are different levels in, involved. Yeah, this almost sorry, this this almost links to a question in two questions time about IPCC. So I don't know how other people's memory of this is, but when I started out in the Met Office, just as the first assessment report was being produced, it kind of felt like the scientific community wanted to be left a bit alone so it could go away and look at this big, massive climate change problem. Um, but of course, the decision makers and policy makers needed to start making decisions and policies as soon as possible. So there's been this tension for the last 30 something years between having the scientific basis at a state where I don't know what the definition is here, but the scientific community are comfortable with big decisions being made on it. And there's a big tension there, I guess, decadal multi-annual or decadal forecasting is another example where um, we have this emerging knowledge capability, modeling capability, huge amount of data. And there are different views on whether the, the markets and decision makers, what stage they engage in that. So I agree with, I think it was Bruce said it originally, so or was it Janetta, that everyone should be involved in this, but it's a fascinating situation that we've all finding ourselves in over the years. There's quite a tension here on this one. It's a great question. I would also like to add something, uh, Daniela. In general, I would agree that like, you, you have to uh, need to have some consensus in science that something can be used, but there are also people that uh, if there's just a small, very small risk that something will occur, that they want to take that into account, even though there's maybe just one model or one research that indicates that there's a certain risk. So it's, it's not that clear that that should be consensus always. It depends on the type of the perception of the decision makers. Yeah, I was not talking about consensus only, so um, I, I yeah. fully agree to what you've said. Uh, I just said there, there must be room for development in science, mm -hmm. which uh, which yeah. sometimes leads also to failure 
in methodologies or so, which we would not then push towards the decision making space. That's that's what I mean. Yeah. yeah. But for me, this this sounds a bit like science is something like a cookie factory or something that uh, that uh, you put something in uh, in a big uh, plot and uh, and you create it and at the end it, it leaves the factory and it's ready for use. And that's of course is not the way science works. I mean. We've been, we've witnessed in these very influential scientific outcomes that have triggered a lot of uh, decision taking, like these extreme sea level scenarios uh, based on early uh, the Gordon Pollard uh, uh, assessments of stability of the Antarctic ice caps, and then later, and a few publications later, and some IPC assessments later, we need to uh, change the, the insights a bit and blah, blah, blah. This is how it works. I mean, science, science, I think, itself determines when it's ready for uptake, and that is when it is convincing. In a way that it is either uh, you know high confidence agreement or there's a high impact uh, that can be associated to it. I don't think we can assign any individual that decides when science is ready. It's it's it, the science itself determines when it's ready. And I also don't believe so much in scientists that that need to retreat to to calm down and or they have an isolated area to to work on their science. This is also engagement per definition. We are continuously talking about co-creation, scientific developments, and, and the co co posting the right questions asked to the scientists, etc. We should not uh, uh, have. That. And again, if science is convincing, it'll it'll enter its way into decision taking. If not, yeah, then then further developments will take place. I don't think this is a very manageable uh, uh, topic, to be honest. Um, I, I mean, I think, as, as Chris says, there are many tensions here um, and something perhaps we haven't mentioned from, from my point of view is that critical here is, is the trust and communication between those groups and the greater that trust is and the, the stronger those relationships and the greater the understanding between people, the easier this gets. Um, and you see that in those really established relationships where, where there's a... Um, a long-standing relationship and, and people are able to have those really open conversations so so that's i think um what we should aspire to there i'm going to skip the next question because i i want to save that for the end um so i'm going to go to the ipcc question because i think this will be interesting um so should future ipcc reports be more focused on climate services and how we communicate the physical climate science, which is now well established. Comments, please. Yes, I, I would agree. Oh. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so I, I would agree to 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 this that we that 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 we should concentrate a lot on the communication part of it, but um, and, and, and because I, you can take different stands on, on how effective IPCC is. We can be very positive about its, its, its ability to have triggered a big uh, climate conference and, uh, and agreements to reduce uh, global emissions. On the other hand, we also witnessed quite a few occasions where, uh, yeah, in the end, the, the real decisions don't really match up with what the science actually tells us to do. So, and, and there I have the feeling that the way we, we convey, or the, we, the IPCC and the climate scientists convey the information, yeah, it's at least, uh, of course, we also need to understand societal hesitation to respond to climate uh, information, et cetera, et cetera. And that, 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 that is something that, that I think we need to be a bit better aware of, 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 that, of what that implies for the way we communicate. But I, I feel personally, also being a lead author in IPCC, that, that we are less effective than we should be. And, and that has also something to do with the way we communicate it. Whether that goes via climate services only, yeah, well, every every outreach could be interpreted as climate services. Even the media coverage on an IPCC report is also a climate service, of course. But yeah, we here we are discussing or narrowing down the climate service a bit more to a, a sort of an organized stream of information from a provider to a user that is basing a decision on that. I'm not sure whether that is the only way how IPCC should convey its its information. There's there's a bit more to to it than just servicing professionals, uh, but that we need to take 
take a, take stock of the, the the effectivity of our communication. I think that is that is clear. So I don't think I'm disagreeing with this, um, but the IPCC's mandate is to assess the scientific literature on all aspects of climate change, its impacts, and society's options. And that's within the, um, the IPCC mandate. So in that sense, clearly, I think IPCC should be focusing or including more assessment of climate services. Because climate services is growing, it's becoming a more important and critical factor. So clearly, IPCC should place more assessment on that. I think why it's also important is that the assessment then carries the authority or the imprimatur of IPCC. Um, and if we want to talk, go back to the earlier question, if we want to talk about a code of practice, code of conduct, um, about how climate services is taken, um, then I think an authoritative voice assessing the practices of climate services becomes really important. And I think along with the WCRP, those are probably then two organizations and maybe the WMO that have the authoritative voice to say, this is how climate services should be going or how it is going. Um, regionally, there may be other, other organizations, but I, I do think IPCC has a scope to increase its assessment of climate services practices. Maybe I can immediately partly disagree with you, Bruce. Uh, <laughs> finally, I will yeah, back to disagreeing. <laughs> so, good position for 20 years. Uh, so, I, I fully agree first that IPCC should assess all aspects of climate change. And with this, that's in the mandate, and with this, climate services and the communication about climate results, climate findings, and so on, is part. So some more social science topics are entering this entire activity. But I disagree with you saying they have a mandate, and I also disagree that WMO or WCRP has a mandate to say this is a good practice or not. Because an assessment for me is a neutral activity. It is assessing as IPCC is doing all aspects of the topic in a transparent way. And then it concludes on some aspects, but it is not saying this is the best or this is the best. And I, I think IPCC has, has, uh, is at the edge of, of leaving the neutral assessment uh, uh, space, sphere, um, with some of their communication uh, communications they do. Uh, so I think that is something which needs to be discussed within IPCC. Um, and, and I think the assessment is important. I think it's really important that we, we have a good sci scientific, scientifically carried out assessment of, uh, of the, 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 the good and the bad parts and the efficient and the non-efficient parts of climate science in a transparent way. But then the next, the conclusions about this, I think that this is uh, where we need a bit more discussion. I, I don't think we disagree, Daniela. I, I think when I'm talking about assessment, we are assessing the effectiveness of climate services, which in a sense is a judgment on how good and bad it is, but it's not putting it in the language of this is good and bad. And so, yeah, I agree. I think assessment of what is effective from climate services mm -hmm. is where it's also no, But also the quality, it's not only effectiveness, Rose. Yes, there are more exactly. parts in climate services which needs to be assessed. So, yeah, um, yeah I agree. Great. Um, so let's move on. Stacey, what have we got next? Um, so we have a question from Sarah. So why are weather and climate services often developed and delivered completely separately? And should this be so? So who would like to take that one? Should I give it a start? <laughs> and then you come in with a contradictory side, Chris. Or so. uh, I say yes, uh, yes, it, it is good. So uh, I mean, uh, not in complete isolation, but uh, I do think that climate services, at least the definition I have, we haven't talked about our definition about what a climate service is. Um, the uh, I think the, um, the climate services are different to weather services. Uh, in, in a large part, and and I do think it is good that um, they have they are in close connection with weather services in the development, but are not completely uh, mirroring uh, what weather services are doing just on a different time scale. 
because I do think that in climate services, there are more non-climatic parts uh, involved, which, uh, which are also in the climate service. So uh, there's a lot of guidance development, uh, framing of, uh, of how to take um, uh, uh, climate data into account to assess the risk for, for a dedicated company or what else. So, I mean, there's a lot of uh, uh, there, there's a lot of uh, uh, to there are many topics involved which are uh, probably not as um, as strongly in the focus in the weather service as they are in the climate service. That's why I think they have. Uh, um, it is good to have them in, in close connection, but uh, not developing within <coughs> one. Yes. Yeah, so if I could jump in, then, so as, as Daniela knows, I've been starting to push this topic um some some recent papers i've written one of them in daniela's journal climate services and another one in in bams and various meetings it's it is an interesting question and i agree with what you said daniela they are different um disciplines is too strong a word but there are there are different approaches in weather services and climate services different use cases but i think there are some areas where they may not be so different and so is, is, are there some areas where we could consider looking across these time scales? Um, I mean, it's just practicalities. We have different forecasting systems. We have weather forecasts and we have climate forecasts and we have climate projections as well. So even on the climate time scale, it's, it's disjointed. Um, the question's gone off the screen, so I can't remember the exact question. But yeah, there are some good reasons why they're separate. Um, it may just be historical. There's different groups, different organisations do weather services, different ones do climate services. There are some organisations do do both, such as KNMI and, and the Met Office. Um, so I think it's an area we should watch personally. Um, and maybe it's the next big thing in climate services. But anyway, one to watch. Yeah. But, right. So I would like to, uh, to, to allude to the necessity to link up to, say, practical uh, implementation of information like what, what is done a lot in the weather services. It's, I mean, the weather services need to be ingested into, say, decision taking on on shorter time scales, and that has to be uh, consistent with the with the decision context, etc. And then also, IPCC has made assessments of climate information, and and they are uh, say the the. Uh, ability of that information to uh, uh, to yeah, inform society in a meaningful way, and then of course part of the, the attributes of that information are about you know uh, confidence and certainty and lead time, etc. But also institutional uh, say consistency that that climate information that that for instance expresses um, uh, changes in the risk for once per hundred year events when that once per hundred year event is already part of the legal framework for, for safety defense, uh, for instance, then that information is much more readily ingestible than when we would just display the entire PDF without that particular uh, uh, institutional, say, referenced uh, number. And that's that's what I would like to, to emphasize, that climate services, they have to match uh, the practical environment in which it is taken up. And, and, and there, I think we are sometimes not 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 operational enough, and that's that's also why I like yeah the assessment of yeah effectivity, but at least uptake of, of information. And I also like yeah the the bi uh, bilateral of the bimodal uh, learning, the capacity building that we really need to learn how that information actually is used in into the decision making process. And there's a lot to learn, I think. And, and weather services have matured over over a couple of decades, and I think we can learn a bit more from that. Yeah, may, maybe just for clarification, I, I do not say that there shouldn't be a close connection, mm -hmm. but for me, for example, the development of a climate resilient uh, um, uh, uh, status for a city uh, or the guidance, 10 steps towards climate neutrality, this, uh, if you give those guidance, this is still climate service for me. Mm -hmm. and, and there's not probably not one single heavy precipitation data involved in this. In this. Yeah. So it's not data. It's not the data dominated part of the climate service. That's and and mm -hmm. this is typically not being done in weather services. So there there, there are also the monetary 
aspects of those or uh, the support of the development of national adaptation plans, how to do this, how to guide the, 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 um, the, the process, the participatory processes to reach those um, or to, to, uh, to develop system, uh, system models. Uh, so there are, there are many aspects in it which are not typically in a weather service. Uh, uh, similar in, in a similar way. So that's why I think they're, they're, they, they have a close connection, but they're separate entities. Yeah, I, I'd like to add something. What, what I often see is that uh, weather services are used for operational tasks and climate service more for strategic decisions. And what is very important, I think, is that if you look at practice at the organizations that use the weather services and climate services, they also have a separation between the operational part and the strategic part. If they would work more together, then it would also be more logical to have more integration between weather and climate services. And they, they are different, although they, they can learn from each other. I think. I would just add a global south perspective here that um, unlike the UKMO or many of the global north weather services, Weather services in the global south often do not have the competency or the capacity to undertake effective climate services. Um, so there's a there's a real uh, capacity issue underlying that. Um, and secondly, there's the issue of authority. Um, the National Weather Service is a legal framework around it about who can issue what statements. Um, there's a perceived authority behind it, um, whereas climate services don't have that legal framework to to operate within, um, which makes it difficult and perhaps it should be that way, but it, it is a factor that plays into the issue, I think. Great points and another great question. Thank you, everyone. I'm mindful of time, so I'm going to um, go to two questions, which I think we can have some really short answers. So just a few words um, at most from each of you. So the first question is, what is the biggest barrier to decision makers making robust use of climate information? And we'll start with Chris. Thank you. Um, gosh, the biggest barrier. You're going to get hopefully six different answers here, so I'll just give one. It would depend on the decision, though. This is, this is a difficult one, but an example, I'm not saying this is the only example, would be um, levels of whatever it might be, skill or reliability or predictability, some way of being able to act on the information. And so for the decision makers, the information they're receiving might not be actionable enough. And that's often, in our experience, a, a big barrier. There are others, but that's just one example, in my view. Over. Bruce. Okay, I'll, I'll talk. <laughs> um, I've got lots of answers, but the single one that I'll pick up on here is I think there's an inadequate or an absence of treatments of effective treatments of uncertainty and contradictions. And I'm not just talking about natural uncertainty that's in the future, but I'm talking about contradictions and uncertainty between products given by a climate service provider and contradictions that exist between climate service providers. Um, and we don't address those. And so a climate service provider comes into a situation, says, here's my product, but somebody else is serving a product that says something else. And we don't address these issues. Daniela? Trust. Trust is the biggest barrier. Great answer, thank you. Murray? Well, I was also going to say managing uncertainty because people I work with, they just want to know a number. Tell us what the value of, of this change is going to be in this variable and we'll we'll adapt to it. And you can say, well, OK, there's going to be a range of potential change, but here are the, here are the range of values. This is how we'd help you support a decision as to which value you pick. But this is always the, the challenge is um, in the end of the day, especially engineers will want a value to adapt to. In, in rainfall change or whatever the value uh, the parameter is. So it's how to get across that um, uncertainty management element in a in a way that's scientifically robust as well as useful. Thank you. Bart? I think to convey your understanding of uh, 
the implications of that climate information to your stakeholders, the, the people that are actually affected by your decision. They have different understandings and different interpretations than you have. And you have still got to use that climate information to convince them that this is the decision to be made. I think that's a big barrier. Absolutely, thank you. And Janetta? Um, well, I wrote down the knowledge on how to translate and incorporate uh, um, the climate information into decision making. And that also includes how to deal with uncertainties and inconsistencies. Uh, that's something else that I wrote down that there's a lot of inconsistency or, or how to say it's not enough overview why different climate services may give different um, information, for example. And that would be really helpful for the users if, to, if they had a better overview and better knowledge to judge the information. Yes, that's a good one. Thank you. Um, the next question, just really short answers, please. I'm not sure how you're going to answer this one. Which economic sector or area of society do you think has the most potential for growth in the use of climate services? And we'll, we'll go the other way around to give uh, people who went last a better shot. So, Janetta, back to you. Um, well, I was wondering a little bit. Uh, I think that that sectors that are in that are, could be great users of climate services are, for example, the energy sector, but maybe also uh, health. Uh, energy, uh, in a certain way, is using already um, climate services, so they have less maybe potential to growth, but they, they have a great potential of using it. I would guess um, water resource management in the global south. I would say the not so much the economic sector, but the developing country uh, sector, if you like, is the area where the huge opportunities for uptake of climate services and beneficiaries. Yeah. I think circular economy is one with a lot of potential for growth using climate services as well as the entire sector around food production and delivery of food. I don't think you can answer which economic, economic sector or area of society on its own because it, that depends where entirely you are in the world. I would like to probably rephrase the question and say what aspect of climate service practice has the most potential for growth and there I would suggest uh, taking a systemic approach to society, treating society as a system as well as treating looking at the sectors, not in place of the sectors, but in addition to the sectors, looking at it as a compound system um, that is mutually codependent. Going last is tough, isn't it? Thanks, Nicola. Nicely done. Uh, I agree with all of those examples. There are no sectors left that are obvious, but um, most potential for growth in the use. I think it's building on what Murray said. So work I did with the Global Framework for Climate Services, it was it was largely predicated on trying to help the most vulnerable. And IPCC, the recent reports have highlighted this fact as well about the most vulnerable parts of society, and the most vulnerable regions. So I think it's those really vulnerable regions in the world where there's the most potential for growth in the use because they don't seem to be using them, getting them, whatever the problem might be. There's a big problem there that we need to address. It's a similar answer to Murray's, sorry, but slightly expanding it. That's great, thank you. And we'll go one more quick question. This one's going to be harder to keep short, but uh, I'll challenge you. So should climate services always be co-produced between providers and users? And if you agree with what everyone else has said, you can just say, I agree. Um, and we'll start with, in the middle, we'll start with Daniela. No, not always, but often. Thank you. Murray. Where possible, yes. Good answer. Um, <laughs> but not co produced, but co evaluated, yes. This is great. Um, Janetta. I would say uh, no, but uh, I think you should always take into account user requirements or wishes. Great. Uh, Chris. 
I agree with all of the previous answers. They shouldn't always necessarily be co-produced, but um, yes, we're, well, the phrase was yes, we're appropriate, or depending on the case. So maybe, but not always. Classic. It depends. And Bruce, can you add anything? Uh, no, it shouldn't be always the case, but I think it highlights one of the biggest challenges. How do you scale co-production to meet the demand? Great. Um, and, and I'm going to go on to my last question now. So um, last comments from the panel, really. Um, I'm actually going to merge two questions uh, just to squeeze them in. So um, my real last question was, what is the next big thing in climate services? So if you can comment on that. But also there's this interesting question about um, the latest forecast for the next five years, giving a 50-50 chance of a year exceeding 1.5 degrees C warming. And are climate services keeping pace with the global climate crisis? So I guess if you merge the questions, um, and think about whether the next big thing, what the next big thing is that, that might help us keep pace. Um, so we'll go to uh, Chris first. You have the same thought process as me. I was thinking those two questions are linked. So yes, there's, we heard earlier in the week at Climate Services Week, there's some other events where we were hearing about, for example, the decadal forecast, and there's so much interest out there. They're making the headlines on the newspapers, at least in the UK. I assume around the world as well. So the next big thing does seem to be there's growing awareness out there from individuals, organisations, governments, whatever it might be about this climate crisis, to use the word on the screen there. Um, and so the next big thing seems to be that climate services, is, there's a big opportunity, but a big challenge as well. There's a huge interest, there always has been, but the interest is potentially about to explode in um, our climate services. So the challenge there is how we match that um, expansion. Bruce just set up scaling, I think. So there's challenges around this. What's the next big thing? Bruce, we'll come to you. Um, incorporating stakeholder context in a meaningful way. Um, we really need to find a way to do that more, more effectively. It requires humility on the part of the climate services person to actually step into the other person's shoes and see it from their perspective, and that is a really hard thing to do. Um, and matched with that, as Chris has just mentioned, is how do we then scale this? Because co-production is labor intensive and stepping into somebody else's shoes takes time. And so we need to find a way to scale the principles of that to achieve the same outcome. Daniela. I think taking, as I said, at the beginning of this meeting, taking into account um, mitigation as well as adaptation, sustainability and digitalization for climate services. I think that's the big step which is needed and and it has a big risk that we are not quick enough with our services um, to, and to fulfill the societal demands um, in, uh, in this rapid changing uh, world, I would say. So um, I think uh, going far beyond what we have done before is needed. Great, thank you. Murray. Um, getting the climate services to those in vulnerable communities, in uh, to benefit vulnerable communities in developing countries, I think is the next big step for me. Um, a bit like what Chris said, so um, I do think there's massive opportunity to do, do a lot more in those spaces. Thank you. Bart? Yeah, I would say uh, monitoring uptake and uh, effectivity. Uh, more thinking about the, yeah, in line with the theory of change that you think about, okay, what, what is the, the sphere of influence of these climate services and that you really make a good monitoring system for them. Yeah, and I think that could have a significant impact on the way that we, we work in climate services. Um, and finally, Janetta. Well, I, I would go one step back because I think that there, there's a lot of uh, climate services that are developed. That's not the problem. But how to get them operational? What are the challenges? What uh, what makes people use it, but not? And then, of course, the, the next step is monitoring. Uh, Great, thank you. And that brings us to the end of our panel session. I'd like to say a massive thank you to all of our panel for um, your time and 
um, considered thoughts and for managing to disagree with each other. So round of applause, please. There's obviously so much more we could discuss um, and lots of challenges I feel that have been given to us. Um, and I hope there'll be opportunities to consider, continue some of these conversations in the very near future. Just to conclude, I'll, um, I'll advertise our next um, session, which is this afternoon, and that will be about research frontiers in climate services. So perhaps um, some thoughts to take forward from the panel to that session, um, and that's perspectives from the Met Office Academic Partnerships. So that's this afternoon, if you can join. Um, and just thank you all for attending, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the week. <laughs>